This episode of Belief Hole is brought to you by SoundIron, a premium developer of virtual instruments and sample libraries for songwriters, composers, and sound designers, serving the best and brightest composers and artists in media today. Coming up on this episode of Belief Hole. This is what Pythagoras realized. Go to the distance between that string, right in the middle, and it's exactly an octave, and you keep doing that fractally. That's the golden mean, and that's what creates our musical scale. Mm -hmm. And if you get off that musical scale, somehow you know that something is wrong. The gold mean, you see it everywhere in nature. You see the ram's horn, spirals and pineapples. Shells. Everything follows this golden mean. 3.14 pi, that's the golden mean. But even music, it's so weird. You don't have to be instructed on this, but you just know that when there's an, a note that is off the scale that you're using, you can just tell that it's not natural. It's uh, wrong. Well, music used to be magic. It used to be magic. It used to be magic. It used to be magic. I want to talk a little bit about cymatics, the study of vibration and its effects on matter. This is so cool. The concepts here are that people in the days of our ancestors were creating reliefs to symbolize these frequencies that we're now seeing through manipulating materials. They show organic shapes that represent geometric figures, molecular structures, and sometimes moving organisms. What? Tuning fork, if that's like the symbol in Norse tradition for a man, does that mean that we are tuning forks for consciousness? Is that a little secret wink that that tradition is Ooh. expressing? Oh, interesting. Maybe our brains are tuning forks. Exactly! Our DNA resonates at a specific frequency that summons consciousness. Ooh. How hard is it to change an entire ideology once a paradigm has been set? Yeah. There's whole vested interests in keeping things in a certain way, and you have to go up against behemoths. And right. You change the way reality functions. There's gonna be people that don't wanna know about that. There's like a pull that happens. Yeah, it definitely shifts you. And that's what's funny. And that's why I think that Robert Monroe recommends binaural beats for attempting out-of-body experiences. It has that effect, that pull you're talking about. Mm -hmm. If you've ever had an out-of-body experience or gotten close to one, you know that sensation. That's right. exactly what it feels like when you have an out-of-body experience. Let's try another one. Oh, wow. This is the one earlier that made my eyes feel thick. It feels good. It's like an internal massage. This sounds so weird and silly, but as soon as that started playing, my fingers contracted. <laughs> Is that weird? Like, the, you know, like, I don't know why I've been like really affected by these. Like in a physical way, I have a response to them. It's weird. Oh, God, wait, hold on. <laughs> there he goes, ladies and gentlemen. And then it happens. Synchronicity, Sasquatch, Homunculus, Alien Races, Satanism in Hollywood, MK Ultra, Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Like, Close the door, in. Jeremy. In. Close your door. What's the uh, Inner Earth disagreements? Ghost Dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman, Bohemian Grove, Corey Feldman, Magicians are Demons, Specters, Spirits, Sleep Paralysis, Strange Disappearances, Sky Whale Phenomena, yes. Alternative History, Shadow People. Shh, quiet, I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. Oh, that's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf Towers. I would never talk about it. That's old. Y2K. Cover ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Well, hello, hello. Hello, hello to you, sir. Oh, hey, guys. Welcome to another episode of Belief Hole. I'm Chris. These are my brothers. I'm John. And final host, Jeremy. I, the final host. That sounds like <laughs> Final Girl, like with the last survivor in a horror movie. The last one to survive, yeah. Switch. On today's episode of Belief Hole, we're going to be covering the supernatural reality of sound. and ancient Ooh. sound technology. This is going to be a fun one. Mm -hmm. What's cooler than that? Not, not, not anything I can think of. Because <laughs> everything comes from sound. Yes, we've discussed that before. In the beginning was the Word, according to the Bible. And the Word was good. And not just the Bible, we're going to get into that. There's cultures all around the world who all specifically spoke of the voice, the word, right. the sound, the song that created and the And if you've ever heard of Terrence McKenna, I know we bring him up occasionally, mm -hmm. but when he travels to other dimensions... When he did, now he's dead, so... 
And well, I guess he's traveling. traveling. What was the term that Everywhere. he used? What was the term he used for his <laughs> shape shifting machine elves? Well, no, for his yes, but the thing that he termed psychonaut. Him, psychonaut. Oh yeah, that's what that was his traveling other dimension to pull back information from the great beyond. Right from these other dimensions. Very and, noble endeavor. Yeah, he did a lot of heavy psychedelics, and when he would visit these other places, they would create material form from words. Uh, oh, that's right. Yeah. Oh, I forgot like about that. Basketballs aspect. or something. Right? They would. Well, the, I guess that's when he was describing the machine elves. He said they were like bouncing basketball type right. entities. Yeah, they were. But the whole point was that they created reality through their through their words. Right. When they spoke, it like manifested. Yeah, it was like. Yeah. You know what's funny about that? Thinking about that now, we're going to get into all this stuff. But another interesting correlation there is the those geometric shapes that he'd always talk about, especially with DMT and these shape shifting machines. Oh machine yeah, elves. the polygonal. Yeah, structures. we're going to get into the. Cymatics, which is exactly that. It's it's the manifestation of sound frequency into form. That's crazy. The, that is a crazy phenomenon. Yeah, and the patterns, man, the patterns that we're seeing today that we're, after d- developing this technology and, and the tools used to do this, we're realizing that in a lot of places around the world, we're seeing these on reliefs in ancient stonework. Well, these tell, same symbols. Let's tell the listeners what we're talking about. If there, you guys may have seen things like this on shared on Facebook, on YouTube. Some There's some popular stuff now where essentially someone will be playing a tone or even some piece of music or something and they it'll be visually represented by uh, a pattern usually using by maybe like a, a sand or coarse powdery right. material laid on top of a, a speaker plate or something like that so when the certain frequency or tone vibrates vibrating the plate the vibrations create a specific pattern in the sub or in the material like a geometric shape yeah, yeah exactly beautiful snowflakes of love and wonder you should definitely check that <laughs> out um type in cymatics and look it up because it is it's insane we'll have a link in the show notes and, too. Yeah, and although we're not focusing on that for a long period today we will get into a little bit because there's some examples i want to show you guys that are pretty mind-blowing the comparisons we'll do a brief dive on that um but i want to start off today's episode with this look into the commonality of this idea that voice word vibration song was the beginning of all life so i think this is fascinating because i mean a lot of people are familiar with the christian bible verse from john in the beginning there was the word and the Mm -hmm. word was good the word was God, that whole thing. But we've got uh, cultures all over the world. So I think it's a good place to start. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I phased out for a second because I was looking at this. What are they called? Cymatics? Mm-hmm. And I just happened to notice one that looked a lot like a they look CERN. Like psychedelics. Like, look, oh, at, whoa. look at, here's CERN. Uh, what is this? A specific uh, piece in CERN. It's, it looks like a centrifuge kind of pipes going oh, into yeah. this kind of the juggernaut shape. Juggernaut, that'd be a sweet name for it. Um, but then I have a diagram here of these cymatics, and this one, D2 in this diagram, we'll have this in the show notes, it just happens to look strikingly like, I mean, it's a, I guess it's a pretty common configuration. But What's crazy, this gets into stuff like um, sacred geometry. Mm-hmm. You know, this all ties together. It's so fascinating. The deeper you look into this stuff, the, the broader this world of yeah. research gets. It looks like a psychedelic painting. Yeah. Well, this looks just like, a, I guess, an, that, an atom. It right? looks like or, a DMT molecule right there. Anyways, we're, we're okay, kind of yeah. looking at all images. This, all this to say that um, when we, you know, we've heard that phrase, like I think you mentioned this, Chris, when I was Googling this, but the in the beginning there was the word. Mm-hmm. And this, that idea means obviously, I mean, if you think about it in terms of creation and vibration, what is word, what is sound? What it's is, vibration. It's the vibration and everything at the, the very foundational structure of our universe. It is vibration that creates creates matter, essentially. Waveforms. Pulling energy out of the, the sub... What do they call that? The uh, zero-point energy? There's a term for that. That space. The quantum arena? Yeah, the quantum level, I guess. The idea of pulling energy out and forming it into matter using uh, vibration, which is what we would think of as, I guess, sound. Well, it's the, like... The word. It's funny, because I remember I did like... A, and this was not at all a deep, a deep presentation, because this was... Uh, my freshman year of high school, but I did it on string theory because yeah. it was this new emerging thing. Quantum leap. And I'm sure I made some exaggerations back then on what the consequences of that theory would be. But uh, this is exactly what we're talking about. According to string theory, everything in the universe, all the particles that make up matter and force is compromised with what scientists call vibrating fundamental strings. Every one of these strings is identical. However, the only difference between one string and another, whether it's a heavy particle that is part of an atom or a massless particle that carries light, is its resonant pattern, how it vibrates. The vibrational pattern determines what kind of particle the string is. One resonant pattern makes it a photon, for example, while another makes it a heavy particle such as those found within the nucleus of an atom. Basically saying like, depending on how that one string vibrates determines what it will become in life, in reality. Right. So it's resonant frequency decides its manifestation, destiny, essentially, mm-hmm. right? 
That's interesting because if whether or not we'll get to the uh, ancient sonic tech later in this episode or into the expansion, that's essentially how that works is it matching the sonic resonance of material with a frequency mm -hmm. in order to destroy, reshape, mold, whatever, in a way that we don't do today, but you can do, and it's advanced. Mold, what? So there's oh, yeah, an idea of yeah. yeah using resonant frequency to soften stone, for instance, right. is one example of an ancient technology they might have used. We this talked like about that before. The idea of when an opera singer mm -hmm. the wine glass breaks the wine glass. Exactly, and that's how that works. What happens is it's the, the build singer up of is resonant frequency. Yes, the amplitude increases of that specific resonant frequency that matches that material to the point where it can shatter. Yeah, it, it creates such a resonance in that specific. It actually liquefies it first. Did you know that? No. Well, like, like it, it's just subtly atomic level. It liquefies that glass. Shut and up, then, Chris. Okay. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I read. Oh, you did? I mean, who what knows? What do you mean it liquefies What, what is it? true? You know? <laughs> it starts to transmute it to a liquid state before it breaks well, it. Well, like a level we can't see. Right. Right, because, I mean, I've seen slow yeah, motion yeah. Well, videos. What's, what's fascinating about sound itself is like... Yeah, you're a sound engineer, John. Tell us. What's I, fascinating I, about well, it? I remember learning about this in school. It's the vibration of things that creates the sound. Right. So I'm thinking like when you just touch like a piece of wood like that, mm -hmm. it's literally vibrating that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to And picture. even crazier, you never actually touch the wood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Isn't that weird? Because of electromagnetic force, you're, yeah, you're I actually don't, I don't believe reaching that. it. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> I, I mean, you're, the for, your force is touching that force. And it, that's, but that's what would make sense is the vibration you're of the it's your force, force and energy, field, yeah. your force field, if you want to say that, touching the force field of the wood uh, molecules. We all just have force fields around us. I mean, at the very basic level, if you believe in microscopes, you yeah, know, I don't believe those neither. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever you want to believe in, no, uh, I'm just messing. It is the idea, though, that it is the vibration, and that is why we are here today. And that's how we, we you guys can even hear us out there. When you like knock on a piece of wood, it's vibrating at like a microscopic level, I guess. Yeah. That's what causes the sound wave. Mm -hmm. And then the elves answer the door, the shape-shifting machine elves, when you knock thrice. There's other things we're going to get to in this episode, too. Sorry, Chris, I didn't mean to jump I was over making a bad your joke. weird joke. <laughs> <laughs> I totally, like, lost it. So the uh, other things we're going to get to if, right in this episode, I believe, is some of the uh, fascinating advanced sonic technology coming out right now. Yeah, right? That Some of it's kind of crazy and creepy, too. Just the, some of the stuff that can be done, uh, but fascinating. Uh, most of it's good, but um, anyways, we'll get to that later yeah, on. Yeah, I mean, this episode, we'll see how much we can get through, because I also want to just briefly touch on, we're definitely going to get into some binaural beats, and our friend Mike over at Sound Iron sent us some beats to check out, uh, so we're going to play some of those, and we got a stinger for him later on. Are they called beats? Binaural Bi beats. Binaural beats. Okay, so yes. when you say he sent us some beats to check out, it doesn't mean like hip-hop track. Nice joke, beats. Jeremy. No, I'm, I'm just, you know, clarifying. Yeah, binaural beats are not hip-hop sure tracks. Sure, some. Well, who, uh, people don't out there know what... Binaural beats well, we're going to get into that. Okay. I mean, this is just kind of for meditation type. Yeah, thing. they're like drones. Yeah, get you in kind of not fully altered states necessarily, but can definitely shift you in a certain well, way. Well, since now we're getting into it. Okay, sorry. We don't binaural have, beats <laughs> are. I was just trying to set up because you mentioned it's basically it. basically you've got, the way I understand it is you have, it's a way to get your brain to conceptualize and what's the word that means to am amalgamize something or when it creates something. It fills it in. Uh, it, yeah, the, but that's a, but there's a word for it. So it's an A. Um, oh, oh uh, nope. Okay. <laughs> Don't have it. I'll come up with it. You guys out there will think of this. Um, but it's a way for your brain to basically replicate a frequency by putting in, okay, for example, eight hertz is too low for your brain to recognize, right? It's a it's just too low of a frequency. What's too low of a frequency? Eight hertz. Oh, yeah. You can't hear it. But you can feel it. With binaural beats. The, in your bowels. The concept is, is that the B frequency? The big B, the big brown B? I don't know if that's... Brown wave. Have you heard about that? Yeah. Where that makes you makes go... You, makes you poop. Dirty your unders. It's like a subsonic frequency. That yeah. It, I think it, it, that's a myth. Although I have heard... No, I think no, that's true. I'm pretty sure... So it's called like the brown wave or something? Or the brown <laughs> frequency? But the idea is that... And I think uh, certain governments and things can use it uh, for crowd control because right. it can basically make you ev evacuate your bowels. I'm you can't stop sure yourself. I'm pretty sure that's uh, not r a real thing. Well, you know, keep going. I'll Google it. Okay, so basically, you've got, let's say you've got let's say you've got a hundred hertz pumping in on one side of your head, one ear, and then you have a hundred eight hertz on another side. When you are listening to both those those uh, frequencies at the same time, your brain is supposed to infer that eight hertz signal, and that's the binaural beat. That's what it's doing. It's creating a way for your brain to take in that frequency you can't normally take in. 
and creates delta waves, things like that, to make you relax meditation and some say out of body experiences. Mm-hmm. Like Robert Monroe. We're going to get into a little bit of that later. But yeah, should we get into the beginning of the universe? Sure. By the way, Wikipedia, who I don't always agree with, uh, says that it is it is only uh, hypothetical at this point. The brown note, but... There are physiological effects, though, of low frequency. Oh, for sure. I, I think that this, I mean, it's hypothetical, but who, you know, I would actually like to do some more research other than Wikipedia to mm-hmm. see if that's true. We should true. experiment with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah let's do that. <laughs> Just start <laughs> aiming at speakers at people. <laughs> I'm, I'm busy that day. <laughs> Uh, all right. Shall we begin? Yeah. Like the creator of the universe? Yes. In the beginning. Shall we begin? Oh, I like this quote, by the way. This is from Plato. Music is a moral law. It gives a soul to the universe, wings to the mind, flight to the imagination, a charm to sadness, gaiety and life to everything. It is the essence of order and leads to all that is good, just, and beautiful, of which it is the invisible, but nevertheless dazzling, passionate, and eternal form. So true. Interesting. I like the idea that it, uh, what does it say it say about justice or all that is right? The essence of order, and it uh, leads to all that is good. It reminds me of um, the idea that like when you hit a wrong note in music, mm-hmm. everyone knows. It's no. inha- it's inherent in us. Regardless of musical training, you just you there's something about you're like Ugh, that's off. not being in the right right. There's something like how do how do we know that? And that gets into like Pythagoras and the golden mean and Bone like ratio. How, how the universe is built on. This is interesting. I was watching this uh, Daffy Duck cartoon the other day, um, <laughs> talking about this golden ratio. And uh, so you take a string, right? Like a musical string. And this is what Pythagoras realized. You take this string and then you go to the distance between that string right in the middle and then you pluck that upper part and it's exactly an octave and you keep doing that fractally. That's the golden mean and that's what creates our scale, Mm -hmm. musical scale. And if you get off that musical scale, somehow you know that something is wrong, mm-hmm. which is weird because that's it's it's the golden mean. You see it everywhere in nature. You see the ram's horn, spirals and pineapples, you know, shells, shells. Everything falls this golden mean, three point one four pi. That's the golden mean. But even music, it's so weird that you don't have to be instructed on this, but you just know that when there's an, a note that is off the scale that you're using, you can just tell that it's not natural. It's uh, wrong. Yeah, the way that that Daffy Duck cartoon explained it, we'll link that in the show notes because it <laughs> actually does a really actually, good job yeah. of explaining how magical it is. Yeah, that the, using the golden ratio, you can basically find the octaves, right, and then in between wherever you put the notes in mm-hmm. in a regular pattern or whatever, uh, you have scales. Right. We talked about this actually in an episode a long time ago, but uh, Pythagoras had like a group of uh, buddies. They get together secretly and discuss their discoveries. Oh of yeah, they were like musical a, they scales. Were a, a cult, the cult of Pythagoras, right? Well, yeah. music used to be magic. Exactly. So did uh, writing. Writing was a form of spell spellcraft. I say this every mm-hmm. episode we talk about. I know. <laughs> we talk about this before. <laughs> That's all, it's just so so fascinating to like think about where all this stuff comes from in our. Yeah. We take so much for granted what we use, the technology we use, even technology s- such as writing or music. You know, we just mm-hmm. we're like, ah, it's just, you know, we learned it in uh, Mrs. Seema's uh, music class in uh, eighth grade. But in reality, like this goes back so long, it's been established in a certain kind of way and we've just, just think that that's how it always Here's has it, been. Inheritors of giants. We're standing on the shoulders of giants. Yes. Yeah. The inheritors of giants. <laughs> it seems your uncle left you a giant in his will. <laughs> Here's Fred. He's a big man. No, but we are, <laughs> what? <laughs> he's Fred. He's a big man. Here's Fred. He's a big. He like inherited a giant. It's a weird mind. metaphor. It's like the beginning joke. of a Disney cartoon. I think. Okay. Yeah. yeah sure. Uh, sure. Anyway, in the beginning, right? Keep going. John, will you read this? I really like this. This comes from the Laguna Pueblo Native American creation story. In the center of the universe, she sang. In the midst of the waters, she sang. In the midst of heaven, she sang. In the center, she sang. Her singing made all the worlds, the worlds of the spirits, the worlds of the people, the worlds of the creatures, the worlds of the gods. In this way, she separated the quarters. Singing, she separated. Upon the face of heaven, she placed her song. Upon the face of water, she placed her song. Thus, she placed her song. Thus she placed her will, thus wove she her design, thus sang the spider, thus she thought. Wow, that's beautiful beautiful and fascinating. Mm -hmm. 
And also it ties into so many of these creation stories. Oh yeah, well I was going to say, first of all, I realized it was a spider towards the end. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of that um, weaving spiders come not here, which is the the phrase for the Bohemian Grove. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the thing here and there, but the idea that like the will and this uh, other idea of the speaking and intention being mm-hmm. being a kind of magic. And right. that's what a lot of people believe magic with a K is all about using your intention and your will. Well, it's also about like, you know, when we talk about creation and vibration, that's really what I'm just saying. by speaking, you're creating. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like that is a form of like music is magic. One of well, one of those ideas of like self-actualization and those kind of things that are kind of woo-woo and self-help. But it's proven, and I and I've heard this a lot too, that in order to make changes in your life, you have to speak them. You have to physically make an action. Yeah. That's why like planning or dream boards or or um what do they say when you uh you kind of repeat something to yourself like in the mantra. Mirror, a mantra or something in the mirror like the, the of affirmations. Mm-hmm. Like I am I'm <laughs> smart. <laughs> Who's that it. guy on SNL? People uh, like me. Yeah, Stuart Smalley or something. It's forever ago. Played by Senator Al Franken. Al Franken. I don't know. Either yeah. way. Uh <laughs> gosh darn it, people like me. But that that kind of idea. It's the will created by that. Yeah, that intention right. creates the manifested will through vibration. Through That's how John speaking. got his sauna. John said, I'm going to get a sauna. And he then he it got it. Times. And then he typed it into Amazon. And then I typed it in. If you keep it to yourself. <laughs> and then I ran my credit card. And then they <laughs> shipped Bing. it. Thank you for your purchase. And then your brothers got tricked into a full day of help. <laughs> I didn't trick you. I thought I was coming over to help you move it into the house. Well, that was the beginning phase. <laughs> it sure was the beginning. <laughs> this is another kind of interesting part of it, too, where she says, the worlds of the creatures, the worlds of the gods... In this way, she separated the quarters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wonder if she's of, talking about like the continents or something. Well, it reminds me of the four corners of the earth. Oh, always, right. Why is it four? Four corners of the earth. Uh, this way, she separated the four quarters mm-hmm. of the world, essentially. Like, yeah. I wonder what that, if there is some kind of connection, there's some greater knowledge we've lost in the, the Library of Alexandria Well, or maybe something. if you listen to the right binaural beats, you can take an out-of-body trip and then explore the Akashic Records to discover the answer. All right, let's do it. Out-of-body trip. All right, Chris, what's our next piece here? Okay, well, continuing on this idea of creation, I wanted to just touch on a couple more here real quick. Of course, we all know the biblical, right? From the book of John. Did to read that, John? The book of awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Spelled differently. I thought it was Genesis. Uh, Genesis is the next one. Okay. Well, you put those out of order. <laughs> hmm. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And then from Genesis? And the Lord said, Let there be light. And then from the Vedas of the Hindu tradition comes the writings uh, that quote In the beginning was Brahman with whom was the word, and the word is Brahman. They state that creation arises from the first sound of the universe, the primordial sound, Om. Right. So, I mean, just again, these interesting things. And uh, the Egyptians, um, some of you might be familiar with this, but they believe that the god Thoth created the world by voice alone. So again, speaking it into creation. In the Popol Vuh, the Maya tradition, the first real humans are given life by the sole power of, quote, the word. Yeah. Again, the word. Well, in the word, the Lord said, let there be light. He said it. Mm-hmm. And that vibration of his, I mean, if you want to go kind of a literal sense, yeah. created the the energetic pulse of light. And this is, uh, this is one of the coolest ones. And I actually found this book, a PDF of it, but I would love to buy it someday. It's expensive, but uh, it's super interesting. So the Druids have an awesome, very similar, again, um, and we know very little about the Druids, but what we do know comes handed down from cultures that were in contact with them. Now, from the book Druidism, the Ancient Faith of Britain by Dudley Wright, he writes, In the collection of bardism made by Llewellyn Sion of Languid in 16th century, the following account is given of the origin and progress of letters, like writing like a, a letter, basically. Right. When God pronounced his name, with the word sprang the light of life. For previously there was no life except God himself. His name was pronounced, and with the utterance was the springing of light and vitality, and man, and every other living thing. That is to say, each and all sprang together. In three columns and in the rays of light, the vocalization for one were the hearing and seeing, one unitedly the form and sound again form and sound and one unitedly with the form and sound was life and in the declaration was his love that is co-instantaneously with it sprang like lightning all the universe into life and existence vocally and co-jubilantly with the uttered name of god in one united song of exultation and joy 
than all the worlds to the extremity of Anwen. It was thus then that God made the worlds. Yeah, so again- oh, It's exactly the same. Right, no matter where you go. And, uh, That's this, Irish or is Celtic? Is, uh, Welsh, actually, um, but Druid, Druidic. This is interesting though, that last word there, Anwen or Anwen, mm -hmm. is the other world in Welsh mythology ruled by Arwen. It was essentially a world of delights and eternal youth where disease was absent and food was ever abundant. It became identified with the Christian afterlife in paradise, but it's it was an Arthurian oh, really? kind of legend, like from King Arthur, that yeah. sort of mythos or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it sounds pretty. So that's Anwen. That I just read that in the uh, the Celtic or the Welsh? Welsh, yeah. What creation the myth? The Celtic culture, Druid culture. That was the creation myth, right? Uh, yeah, of writing. Oh, of writing of letters. Okay. Yeah. So that was interesting. There's yeah. there's a lot more to it, and I'll link to that book. I'll link to the PDF because that is free online of that book. Uh, I started reading it, and I just got sucked in for like half an hour, and I wasn't it wasn't even necessarily about this show, but just the the culture of the Druids is fascinating. And yeah. Even though we don't know a lot, that what we do know is really interesting. Well, we don't know a lot because they were an oral civilization, right? As right. far as the way that they passed down their knowledge yeah. was all oral based. Is that right? Yeah, and they got wiped out by the Romans. For the most part, we have like runes and things like that, but it's yeah. kind of up to interpretation exactly what. Right. What those well, and mean. that's what that's that whole section that I was reading. There's a lot more to it, but it's about the runes, the the invention of the rune, and that three lines that he was talking about that was God, mm -hmm. that the Creator made uh, His name with these three lines, and then mankind is basically like the letter Y. But th those are part of the runes in Norse. But that's tradition. what's interesting is the letter Y. It's kind of like well, like the one stem and then the two prongs mm -hmm. up top, like a tuning. I know where you're going. Like a tuning fork. Exactly. And that's what I would argue from the research that I've done so far on this that we're going to be getting into the expansion is uh, some of the technology that we used that the ancients, specifically the Egyptians, used was a sonic technology that may have been specifically created after a tuning fork. Yeah. Essentially using to resonate the resonant frequency of the material that you're using to work with. And the, there's a scepter, a specific Egyptian scepter, that I think it was Horus, the god Horus that he had. Look like a tuning fork? And it looks like, I'll pull a picture for you right now, this will be in the show notes. You said a tinning fork? A tanning fork? Did anyone see my tanning fork? Well, you're looking, Jared, it's weird because I was just thinking about this, but a tuning fork, if that's like the symbol in Norse tradition for a man, does that mean that we are tuning forks for consciousness? Is that the little secret wink that that, that tradition is Ooh. expressing? Oh, interesting. Like Maybe our brains are tuning forks. Exactly. Our DNA resonates at a specific frequency that summons consciousness, mm -hmm. right? Oh, you were telling me something really interesting about uh, something kind of freaky about uh, like souls or uh, the uh, something about things that can, when you're having, when you're having birth, I'm having a lot of trouble <laughs> speaking my thoughts right now. But, you're not birthing your words right. Uh, remember something like the, the, the very active resonance of life itself, the life energy, when there's that coming together through like sesquil intercourse. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That there are, sesquil. There are things that are attracted <laughs> to this, right? Not uh -huh. like the consciousness souls, right. but there's also like not necessarily even human souls, but animal yeah. souls can be attracted if like, oh, well, that, I think that was the idea. If there was a, if you, if there's a traumatic- I just tell you. Why don't you do that? <laughs> there was a, a guy, I don't have this ready at all, but there was a guy who died recently and uh, his book, that was finished by another author. He's this really well-known uh, sort of psychic kind of guy who was a writer in the 60s and 70s, 80s. But he, uh, one of the things that they found in his unpublished book was this, this concept that it's a great psychic secret that it's all about believing. It doesn't matter really what you're believing in as long as you believe in that truth that you sort of have this force field of protection. And one of the things he said that was about life in general, some people that if you don't have a belief in anything, after death, you might get kind of stuck temporarily in a sort of nothingness. Oh, right. And um, But he said, one interesting thing is these people that have never thought about any sort of, uh, they're very materialistic only. They'll still have some sort of rebirth eventually, but they'll be attracted to, like it's blind attraction to conception of life. So uh, when people are, you know, doing the funky dance, you know what I mean? <laughs> the funky dance. Then you'll have these souls basically that have disincarnated or died will be attracted like moths to a flame. The ones that that aren't really aware of what's happening because to them. Because they're so devoid of right. like anything then, beyond the material. This is this one, this guy, yeah. he's a very controversial figure, but this is his, one of his ideas. Yeah. Sounds um, true to me. Oh, it, was, <laughs> it would to you, Has John. anyone seen my tuning fork? <laughs> <laughs> I need to get tuned into this egg. The kind of the, one of the funny things he said was in this writing was that uh, it does it's not necessarily a human. So there could be like gnats 
conceiving larva or something and the, a human soul will blindly just oh, go into there or get scary. its life. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought that was interesting. You go from a human being to a gnat. You're right. Well, at least it'd only be like a few days before you're like, well, <laughs> try again. Again, if I mean, I have no other information to give me right now, so don't do not take my yeah, word for no, this. No, no, it's interesting. And, idea, and also, though. also, um, even if you believe this guy in this in this idea, we'll do his, we'll do this later on another episode. But um, it's only those that have completely no thoughts about anything outside of just materialistic concepts of life. You have no. And anybody who yeah. listens to our show has a, some have thought about something other than just the black and white. This or is may have some open mindedness about your consciousness existing outside right. your material self, your physical body. Life after death. You'll probably get to float into another human if you yeah. want. Anyways, here, this will be in the show notes, guys. This is a picture of the uh, scepter of Horus. Ooh. And oh, it, I can see that. Does, does it not work. look... Take a look at this, John. Does this look like a specific kind of instrument? So this this is an actual... Oh, I just got attacked. Oh, it's on me. Settle down, Chris. No, it's a ladybug. That's a symbol of death. No, this is a big one. He hit me in the neck. How oh, is the ladybug a symbol of death? I'm pretty sure that's right. No, it's supposed to be bad luck. Really? Mm-hmm. Ladybug. They're so friendly, though. They bite. Real ladybugs bite. Really? I think, unless it's the... There's an imposter ladybug. I can't remember the name of it. One of them is a biter. That's Roddy Dangerfield. Get out of here. Oh, the ladybugs? <laughs> Great Great ladybug. film. He's a biter. Soccer team. I'll tell you what. <laughs> I got no regard. No regard. <laughs> That's the Simpsons version of him, I think, was his line. <laughs> I got no regard. Everyone's getting laid tonight. That was a terrible, <laughs> was terrible uh, impersonation. impersonation. I should be ashamed of myself. <laughs> I've seen that movie so many Is times. Is that Caddyshack? Yeah. Anyway, here's an actual Egyptian scepter. This is in the uh, Auckland Museum. What was that used for? That's awesome. Well, that's the thing, is the idea is that it's just a symbol of power. It's a staff, a scepter. But when you actually look at it, and we'll get into this in the, more in the expansion. It's like uh, what they had in that uh, Stargate, where you had yeah, the, the like blast people with that laser. <laughs> was that, that was the scepter, wasn't it? Then mm -hmm. they kind of had the same two-pronged yeah, exactly. sort of staff. Yeah. And that's what's fascinating is if you can break it down as like a tuning fork, and there's reasons to believe that they did use some kind of sonic drilling technology. Um, we'll get into the expansion. It's really interesting, but there is just all this to say there is a lot in our ancient world that points to a kind of advanced knowledge of sound and sonics yeah. in use for developing a society that we totally lost touch with. So that'll be fascinating to explore in the future. Well, I want to get into real quick before we do a break, I want to talk about a little bit about cymatics. This is so cool. This stuff is so neat. And uh, you guys definitely check it out. Some, there's videos online. People that create art using cymatics. And the concepts here are that people in the days of our ancestors were creating reliefs to symbolize these frequencies that we're now seeing through manipulating material. So really, yeah, this comes from an article I'll link in the show notes here. Somatics is the study of vibration and its effects on matter. Dr. Hans Jenny was a Swiss medical doctor and scientist who's been researching this field for many years. He photographed different substances, liquids, plastics, mushroom spores, that's interesting, paste, powders, etc., as they were being vibrated by sound. They show organic shapes that represent geometric figures, molecular structures, and sometimes moving organisms that resemble starfish, what? human cells, and microscopic life. Really? Moving organisms? Yeah. So again, pointing to the idea that frequency, sound frequency is, even in aspects like this in a laboratory setting, creating at least or manifesting recognizable patterns. So here's an interesting idea that uh, CRISPR, right? The idea that we can genetically modify ourselves. You said in an, a recent episode, an off-the-cuff episode that hasn't been released yet, but you talked about giving someone a pig snout by uh, <laughs> twisting the DNA of their molecular structure. Wouldn't be my first choice. Uh, or switching genes on and off, right? But what's interesting is if you go deeper, this is the argument that without even needing something like CRISPR, if you could alter the resonant frequency of genes, for instance, or or just affect the resonant frequency of genes to vibrate a certain gene on or off, maybe mm -hmm. you could do it through sound technology, especially if at the beginning was the word, and that is yeah. really the manifestation of matter through vibrational sound right. energy, you know? Well, exactly. And that's, well, that's what we're talking about. Here. I mean, duh, right? Forming matter through energy, frequency, Yeah. right? Oh, I want to just show you guys an example real quick of this. One of the most, I think, spectacular examples of cymatic, what I call madness, uh -huh. is this. Cymatic is madness. Is this real? This is real. Well, from what is I can... Is this picture real? I mean, debunk it. This will be it. in the show notes, guys. Debunk it if it's not, but I'm pretty certain. 
Um, ooh, new order. Thank you. We should read this on the show since they just bought a shirt. Yeah. <gasps> we got a shirt Dogman fire. t-shirt sale. Thanks, Seth. Seth Atkins. Thanks, man. Ooh. Carrie and Seth. I don't know who which one bought it. Anyway, normally we don't do that, but it happened to come in right as we're doing the show, so that's cool. <laughs> Seth Atkins. Seth and Carrie Atkins. Thanks. Hopefully it's not a Carrie buying it as a present for Seth because it's... <laughs> it just gave the, it away. The, the billing address is different from the shipping. Oh, uh, well, we'll reach out before we hear that. <laughs> um, okay, so check this out, this comparison, John. You see that up there? Yep. So this is interesting. This very ancient symbol made an interesting appearance in modern times as a result of a series of experiments in the field of cymatics. The sacred Hindu symbol, Om. When correctly intoned into the tonoscope, a device that transforms sound into their visual representations on a screen, produced a circle which then filled it with concentric squares and triangles, finally producing, as the last traces of the M disappear from the screen, the magical figure of Sri Chakra. Sri Yantra. Sri Chakra. Oh, up top it says Sri Yantra Mandala. Okay, either way, isn't that pretty crazy? <laughs> so basically like yeah. the, the OM. Dude, I've seen this symbol before and it's not that. I mean, that is that symbol, but it's also somewhere else in modern times. Does it look familiar to you? Oh yeah. What is that? I don't know. Is it? Hold on. Something to do with uh, the Illuminati. But check it out. Like how crazy Perhaps. is that? Oh, on the dollar bill. Is it look at the back of the dollar bill? No, is that where it is? Where did I see this symbol before? It's like a... It looks before like, we find a new meaning for it, okay, it's sorry. pretty amazing that this is their symbol for this mantra. And then when you actually look at, you know, thousands of years later, we're able to test this, oh. and it is actually the pattern of that frequency. Oh, you're saying they had a symbol for this mantra already. On the left, that's the symbol and for the mantra. Look. I, I see that. So I didn't understand this at first. So what you're saying is they had a symbol they used to represent this mantra, and then when they actually used a, a tonoscope to uh, monitor the vibrational of making resonance. that sound. Oh, it cre actually created that. Now, here's the question. That's weird. Did the crazy? chicken or the egg? Yeah, was the intention <laughs> creating that pattern or was the pattern already identified? That's Did they just know? I think the argument is they're, that they're making here is that much like a lot of other evidence points too that you're going to get into later, Jer, in the expansion, uh -huh. that the ancient Hindu culture was aware of the frequency representations that these mantras made because it is the manifestation of energy into form. Yeah. So they knew these things. We're just rediscovering the technology that they already had. That's, right. I think that's the argument. Again, fact check me on this. So this is the kind of what this reminded me of. And the guys, we'll have this in the show notes. I've seen this symbol. I want a more advanced version of what I'm thinking of. But it's essentially a double triangle with an eye in the middle, kind of like the Illuminati symbol or something. Oh, right. But if you look at this... The, on the tonoscope picture, it does almost look like there's an eye in the center. It looks kind of like a uh, flipped pyramid mm -hmm. up and down. I'm not saying this is an Illuminati well, yeah. symbol, obviously. I'm and just, I, I mean, obviously, if there isn't, we, we did an episode on that. the Illuminati knows something and they're using it. Well, Sorry, that's, Chris, we, if we do, we did an episode on Illuminati stuff before and like, obviously, they were allegedly, you know, these carriers of ancient knowledge. So they right. would have just been taking it from the yeah, Indian yeah. culture, they, you know? Yes, they were the light bringers. <laughs> They had a light bulb. See, they could use it for their own purposes. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that the tool itself is negative. Because obviously these... No. So who are these people that were using it? Who were they? Oh, you mean this specific right here? Yeah. Who are they? This was the... Uh, this is They're a Hindu, Hindu. Ancient Hindu. Yeah. Ooh. Oh. Okay, cool. I mean, there's... This is, and this is, again, just a little taste. We'll have more examples of these in the show notes. They're, these are really cool, these comparisons. And uh, when we come back from our break, we'll get into some binaural beat stuff. And uh, maybe talk about OBs for a minute before we get into the ancient tech. Uh, and we're going to play some samples of these from uh, our friends over at Sound Iron. Mike sent some of those over. Um, and speaking of Mike, we have a stinger for him on today's episode, right, John? That's right. Oh, yeah. Thanks for signing up, Mike. I'm excited for this. I heard a little, like, a taste. It was pretty, yeah, this pretty is, great. He had the idea of doing a uh, kind of a parody of a guided meditation. Awesome. So for best results, put on your headphones. If not, yeah. turn it up, sit back, and... Follow along. Yeah. Close the eyes. Hello, and welcome to this week's guided meditation. Relax and listen to the sound of my voice and let the stresses of your life fall away <laughs> one by one. Marty I want you to imagine yourself I like this. in a field of light radiating down and giving birth on your shoulders and face. <laughs> Allow it to warm your body and penetrate the surface of your form's being. 
you can feel the grass on your feet as you walk casually to the other side of the field. It's very relaxing. Now, <laughs> imagine yourself floating in the shallows of a clear blue ocean. You look over and see Jimmy, the happy-go-lucky dolphin. <laughs> he notices your pain and swims up to lick your feet. Nice. Isn't Jimmy a sweet dolphin? Doesn't he have the most beautiful smile? <laughs> Creepy. <laughs> now, as you feel the serene water lap against your doughy form, Remain soft and willing as the mighty sea god Leviathan opens his gaping maw to consume all your worry, hopes and dreams, and to feast upon all that you once were, all that you ever could or would be, so that you may never feel fear or stress or anything else human again. <laughs> wow. And as the world fades into a black abyss of nothingness, imagine the earth exploding into a trillion pieces. It's not relaxing anymore. <laughs> Each happening? one shaped like your favorite third grade teacher. <laughs> a perfect specimen of potty breaks and carpet story time. <laughs> now imagine yourself turning into a digital device. <laughs> Ones and zeros coursing through your veins, mm -hmm. floating through the digital space of evermore. Brought to you by computer engineers and software specialists. At the very top of this JS file, which again is... <laughs> Encoding away all the disappointment into ones and zeros. A nightmare. <laughs> it's a JS file. <laughs> Becoming an eternal robot of happiness. <laughs> Finally, as you fade out into the rocket ship of myopic desertedness. <laughs> know that the infinite whispers of Stephen Hawking's pulsating lightgasms <laughs> beckon lightgasms. your sweet and doughy life force. Why am I doughy? <laughs> <Doe? laughs> Actually, him. Yeah, that's great. Is that there? That's where you leave us. That's it. It's <laughs> kind of terrifying, dude. That's great. Yeah, it got weird and dark, but still, it was wonderful. Yeah, it was all over the map. I felt oddly at peace at becoming like a cyborg. I feel like you were you <laughs> like in, being assimilated. Were you envisioning Jeremy with the dough, the doughy? Yeah. So it what? Was, no, I'm no, not, not envisioning great him. A but solid it was a form. joke. It was an inside joke, kind of. I've made of basalt. And <laughs> alabaster, <laughs> my form, thank you. Alabaster, Adonis, you are. Yes. That was great, John. That was good. good Very work. good. Hope you like that, Mike, at yeah. Sound Iron. Thank you for the idea. Yes. It's excellent. Yeah, and thanks, Mike, for the uh, subject recommendation for today's episode. And for sponsoring. And absolutely for sponsoring today's episode. We touched on a few topics Mike brought up, uh, but we'll definitely be getting back to some... There's so many topics that when you get into the, the, the strangeness and supernatural side of sound... There's so much out there, really, that you can get into. We'll be cycling back on this topic a lot. There's a lot of interesting ones in here we, we're not going to get into that I'm really interested in looking into, like the Knights Templar building churches along ley lines, mm -hmm. um, sacred geometry within the temples, things like that. Sound really cool. The Sino, what are those called? The cymatic symbols. 
Right. So Mad Symbols. Stone. Yeah. So thank you to Sound Iron for sponsoring this episode. If you guys are interested in getting some virtual instruments, right, John? Yeah, they're a virtual instrument sampling company. And uh, they first contacted us, liked the show a lot, and he gave me some products to sample. Mm -hmm. They make a ton of different amazing instruments. You said there's an awesome horror collection they have, right? Yeah, they have. uh, I use a lot of their horror stuff. And they actually gave us a discount code today right. for one of their more popular products. It's called Six Six. Six Six. So it's S I C K and then the number six. Mm-hmm. And that's a horror pack, right? Yes. We'll leave the coupon code below. It is Belief Hole One. Yeah, it's Belief Hole One. No spaces, number one. Thirty-three percent off. You put that code in at checkout. Yeah, if any of you guys out there are interested in making movies, documentaries, YouTube videos, podcasts like this. And want some good sounds to use, samples for your, or maybe even just a class project, or whatever it is. Uh, yeah, this would be a great library to use. It's called Six Six, and they have, like I said, they have tons of other instruments and other sample libraries there. So if you like sound, like we do, definitely check them out. Yes. And uh, I also just wanted to briefly mention that all the sounds that come in this library are in standard wave format, so everyone can use them in whatever audio or video editing software that you have. However, if you want to use the presets that come with this, you're going to need a copy of Native Instruments Contact Five Player or later. The presets provide a lot of added features and control but they're not necessary for your average beginner or user. So check out the link below if you're interested in finding out more about 6.6. Special thanks to Soundiron again for sponsoring this episode. Yeah. Remember, sound is everything, guys. It yeah. is. Get into if you it. want to learn how to close Leviathan's gaping maw, <laughs> definitely check out Soundiron because they sure, have the tools you'll need. Pretty sure Mike, Mike said they have a pack about closing gaping maws of Leviathan I think so. and gods. Yeah, and it's John, one of their bestsellers. <laughs> you can use this in like, uh, what, like a- Acid Ableton Live, all those yeah, kinds all of the, programs. All the digital audio workstations, the DAWs, that's, Contact. What, that's what the pros say. Okay, cool. <laughs> or even the amateurs. Yeah, and for extra details about that, check out the link in the show notes, guys. Go to our, our uh, episode page and we'll have all the breakdown of that, how to get, uh, get this going for you. All right, guys, and when we come back, get excited. We're going to get into some, we're going to play some binaural beats. You get to check them out yourselves. Try not to um, leave your body if you're driving. Um, we're going to talk just briefly about Robert Monroe. We've discussed him before about his out-of-body experiences. And then we're going to get into some ancient tech, some sonic supernatural sexiness at the end. So we'll see you in a minute. Guys, welcome back. Hope welcome back. Enjoyed your break. It was sonically satisfying. It wasn't sonically satisfying. It was sonic terrorism. Oh, on our end, John chewed his weird trail mix into the microphone <laughs> like an old is, woman. This is off mic stuff. <laughs> yeah, don't bring it back. Still I don't getting the hear goo it. out of my ear. <laughs> you didn't like that? No, it was, it was just intense. Sonic terrorism. <laughs> That's a great band name. It is a good band name. It's like every episode, there's a good band name that comes up. Okay, moving along. Um, so. One thing I was going to ask, Chris, when we're talking about this cymatics and these symbols, uh-huh. the patterns created through frequency, it reminded me of, and I guess it's not exactly the same thing, but similar, uh, Masaru Emoto. Remember that guy? Masaru Did he make Emoto? all the Nintendo game he was soundtracks? The, Masaru Emoto. He was the guy who did, do you guys remember the, water? what the bleep do we know? Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. The water. So mm-hmm. his his idea and his experiments, he was a businessman, uh, an author from Japan, and he basically developed this theory about the effect of human consciousness on the molecular structure of water. So he would do things like, from what I recall, he would take like... Uh, he put blessings on the bottles of water. Yeah, like he'd, he'd have a Tibetan monk uh, say a blessing. Right, or, or he'd write something that meant like hope. A positive message like yeah. love on the... And it was about, depending on what the intention was with regards to the interaction of the person in the water, if it was like a you know, loving intention, like writing love on the bottle and taping it to it, they'd freeze the water. And depending on what the intention was, mm-hmm. you would get different patterns. So it is- On the molecular level. On the molecular yeah. level. So it is the same as far as considering the idea that vibrational, like your intention, everything is 
vibration, mm -hmm. right? So your intention has a vibration, has a resonant frequency. That's when you hear like, if you want to talk about like the typical woo woo, like, oh, well, you just need to raise your vibration, like the you know, the energy, go just raise your vibration, man. You'd be cool. Everything's fine. Uh, that idea comes from the idea that everything is vibration, right? From the very beginning. So our, our resonant frequencies of ourselves to resonate to a higher level of consciousness, for example, this kind of proves that idea in a sense, if you want to believe his experiments. Yes. I, and before you get into those, mm -hmm. I always wondered like if this was true or not. It seems true. Yeah. I mean, like it was Power presented as truth, but like, did you look into the experiments? Did you find any like way to verify them? No. Well, this didn't even occur to me until Chris started talking about cymatics. Oh. So I didn't look into, but I do have his Wikipedia page up right now, since we're talking about it. There was scientific criticism. I don't think there's been any suggestion that it was hoaxed. What's the scientific criticism about? Let's see. We should, maybe we should explain what it is first. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. So this, according to, this is just, I'm just going off Wikipedia page to complete transparency here because this wasn't a part of our research for this episode, but it relates. So according to Wikipedia, Masaru Emoto's ideas related to this. Emoto said that the water was a, quote, blueprint of our reality and that emotional energies and vibrations, quote, could change the physical structure of water. That's what essentially we do with his mm -hmm. experiments. Emoto's water crystal experiments consisted of exposing water in glasses to different words, pictures, or music, and then freezing and examining the aesthetic properties of the resulting crystals with microscopic photography. I didn't even realize he freezed things. Yeah, that's that's, that's where he okay. analyzed the pattern. I mean, that's what it looked like, snowflakes. That kind of makes sense, too, because you're essentially freezing in time mm -hmm. whatever energy was there, right? He claimed that water exposed to positive speech and thoughts would result in visually, quote, pleasing crystals. Like geometrically aligned. Right, exactly. Symmetrical. Like harmonic, pretty, like what we were talking about before, like the octave structure. Yeah, creating like beautiful patterns. So snowflakes, essentially, pretty snowflakes. Yeah, is that's what, they, what look. they look like. So those would be formed when the water was frozen and that negative intention would yield, quote, ugly frozen crystal formation. So what was that, Chris? It was, you just lift it up there. Yeah, it's uh, just an example. Someone wrote, I hate you on the bottle. They wrote, I hate you on the glass. And right? it, it, this alleges that on the molecular level, it is a disorganized, kind of messy, just, it looks chaotic. It looks like not uh, pollution. Cool. It does. Cancery, right. like, it just looks like... It's out know? of balance, bad coloring. Oh, it does look like, it looks like cancer. It does, yeah. yeah. That's creepy, dude. Just, it looks like the opposite of like beautiful organization, uniform universe. It looks like chaos, death, destruction. It looks like Freddy Krueger's face. It looks like government. <laughs> so exactly, it's just bureaucracy Bureaucracy, right there. that's just bureaucracy. the word. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so essentially, we'll have this in the show notes, but yeah, we have uh, love, thank you, and I hate you in these different forms. You Definite snowflake, beautiful crystal snowflake you could see on your windows during Christmas with the blue neon lights, and then I hate you, which is just brown, like... Vomit. It, Sludge, it vomit. looks like when you fry cheddar cheese way too long, on like a, <laughs> leave it on the scale. I like that, the crunchy stuff. Yeah, but you don't like it in your body when so it's water. So was there a scientific... There, is there scientific... Um, Skepticism? Yeah, yeah, let's get to that here. There's gotta be, I would imagine. I wonder if anyone else has tried to repeat the experiment, too, because this seems like a very important mm -hmm. thing if it's true. Yeah. And uh, I always wondered how true this was. It seemed like it could be true, but... So, power of intention. According to this article, and it, they did say that his uh, suppositions changed over time to a certain degree. They said that early on, he believed that... Oh yeah, this was kind of interesting if this is true. Emoto's conjecture evolved over the years, and his early work revolved around, quote, pseudoscientific hypotheses that water could react to positive thoughts and words, and that polluted water could be cleaned through prayer and positive visualization. That'd be awesome. So, I mean, it goes back to the idea that, like, through intention, you can change reality, right? What was Dr. Wayne Dyer's classic line we love to quote? Uh, when you change the way you look at things, the, the things, things you, you look, look at, at change. change. Exactly. Rest in peace. Which I do, I believe that, like, at a, at a basic level. I think that we do manifest our reality with intention, thoughts. Yeah, and, I mean, even when you make that decision to shift on the way you think your actions are going to be different exactly you know we should do a whole episode i see how this kind of connects because we talked about the uh the synchronicity vibration manifestation yeah but we should do like a psi powers episode psychic phenomenon effects as in the real world because do you guys heard about the uh, number generators oh yeah, yeah. 
So about how like they would have these around different places and like there would be these big like events that would affect- consciousness experiments? Yeah. Like a Jungian They would have these thing. running during like things like 9-11 would occur or whatever, or they would have large masses of people like all concentrating right. and praying. And then these numbers would get less random from these generating machines. Mm-hmm. Everyone is vibrating at the same frequency. Exactly. So it's just another one of these examples. Ooh, interesting. There's some interesting holes we could go down there. We the should future. go down, make that a belief hole hole. Yeah. I almost got chills like I did last night when we were trying out those uh, binaural beats for- uh, ASMR? No, not ASMR. Uh, you want to get into ASMR, John? We can talk about it. Uh, so, did we want to talk about the, the criticism of this real quick? We are going to say what we were doing last night. We'll, we can, we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. All right, continue. This is the scientific criticism to wrap up uh, Amoto's work here. Don't spoil it. Commentators, Do you guys remember the smell of cassette tapes on like Christmas? <laughs> when you'd open up a new yes. cassette tape? I remember tape Nintendo packages. Like plastic. I remember Goosebump book smell. I just had a vivid memory of Bobby Brown's humping around on Christmas time. Bobby? Humping around? <laughs> you got that for Christmas? Yeah. From who? They didn't know. Mom and dad? They didn't know. Yeah, they didn't know. He got that and then he got a Michael they W. They thought Smith it was like tape. a song about whales or something? <laughs> I don't even know if... I, think it, I don't think the record Christmas was tree. called Humping Around. I think okay. It was one of like the tracks? One of the tracks. <laughs> Read the back of your kids' music boxes, parents. But he yeah. also did the Ghostbusters themes. Good point. Anyways, I just, the smell was, I remember it vividly. <laughs> smell. Weird. It's a weird having a stroke. Something you said triggered that memory. Having a stroke right now. Weird. What did I say? The, the scientific criticism. I oh, let's see. What is the Emoto. criticism? Maybe it's because I said Emoto. And you thought of Nintendo because I said Nintendo earlier. I don't remember. Okay. Anyways. <laughs> yeah, so... Talking about a rabbit hole. Tying this back into scientific criticism of his ideas. So commentators have criticized Emoto for insufficient experimental controls and for not sharing enough details of his approach with the scientific community. Wah, wah, we want you to share. Well, that would be good to know. That was yeah. an annoying voice. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's in, how scientists sound. In addition, in addition, no, I, I do, there should be transparency. I agree with that. In addition, Amoto has been criticized for designing his experiments in ways that leave them prone to manipulation or human error influencing the findings, according to Wikipedia. I feel like this Wikipedia explanation is designed in a way to not really give me a clear answer of why it's a skepticism. It's pretty vague so yeah. far. Basically, like they just don't have enough information Neither from do his I. work. Uh, <laughs> biochemist and director of microscopy at University College Cork, William Revel wrote, quote, it is very unlikely that there is any reality behind Emoto's claims. Oh, well, another scientist says it's unlikely. So <laughs> there's, therefore... It, where, um, wait, does he say why? Is that, is that where it ends? What's the word? Unsubstantiated? Yeah, well, there's another word that's been going around a lot lately. Yeah. Re- read that. Uh, Revel noted the lack of scientific publication and pointed out that anyone who could demonstrate such a phenomenon would become immediately famous and probably wealthy. Oh, so right. He didn't look into it at yeah, all. He just says, like, yeah. well, we would have known well, about that's this already. How, you know, that's how it works. The skeptics, I guess there are a lot of skeptics that think like that. They're... But you can't really be in the scientific community and feel that way. You have to understand. I mean, I think that's a fair concern to have. But right. then you can't say that it's yeah. very unlikely to be real if you never test how, yourself. How hard is it to change an entire ideology yeah. once a paradigm has been set? Yeah. Like there's whole vested interests in keeping things right. in a certain way. And you have to go up against behemoths. And right. you change the way reality functions. There's going to be people that don't want to know about that. Yeah. I do wonder why he wasn't as transparent as he could have been. Like, Yeah, I don't know. He this, could have been this totally happened. non-transparent. So the next thing that does say in here, which is kind of interesting, is writing about Emoto's ideas in Skeptical Inquirer, physician Harriet A. Hall concluded that it was, quote, hard to see how anyone could mistake it for science, end quote. Emoto was personally invited to take the $1 million paranormal challenge by James Randi in 2003 and would have received $1 million U.S. if he had been able to reproduce oh, wow. the experiment under test conditions agreed to by both parties. He did not participate. Huh. So, well, I mean, we don't know the real background of that. We don't even know if that's true. That's true. I mean, but I would like to maybe look into that a little bit more and see if anyone else has reproduced mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Because right. I feel like there'd be other people trying to do that it if seems that were true. Odd, it seems odd to me that that film with the bleep do we know, because I felt like that came from a sort of scientific, maybe it didn't. Maybe it was all a, a hootie do. Um, what is a hootie do? I just was tired of the word woo woo. So. Uh, all higgledy piggledy situation going on there. Maybe it wasn't really backed by any sort of scientific integrity. I, I just assumed it was because it was really cool. Yeah, that's <laughs> the music and the flashes. They got you. I mean, now we look into that stuff. But back then, well, that was like 99 or something. I would like to find out if anyone else. Because I feel like because it was such a powerful doc, and, and I've heard many people talk about that over the years. Yeah. Man, they just want to shit on this guy. So the reception of his book, The Hidden Messages in Water, was a New York Times bestseller. Here's how why critics are dicks. Commenting on the book making the list, literary critic Dwight Garner wrote in New York Times, sorry Dwight, New York Times book review, 
that it was one of those, quote, head scratchers and that made him question the sanity of the reading public, describing the book as, quote, spectacularly eccentric. In other words, like, I don't understand how it made the lists. Are people that dumb? Well, that's a high form of criticism is insulting people. Later, Publishers <laughs> Weekly described Emoto's later work, The Shape of Love, as, quote, mostly incoherent and unsatisfying. Well, it might have been. It might have been. But it's just funny, like, any positive reviews? Well, we won't get those in yeah. the reception list from Wikipedia. Well, look, all you need yeah. is love. It is all negative. Why would they just report, I guess, because obviously that's where they're coming from, is yeah. that this guy's... Because his message is that if people be love nice each other, yeah. then the world becomes a better place. Who wants that, huh? <laughs> Speaking of being nice to each other... Can we just be dreamers, you know? Should we play a couple of binaural beats? Sure. Yeah, we kind of, kind of discussed what that was earlier. We um, went on a tangent. Yeah, we did. It was related. So last night, Jeremy and I, getting into the binaural beat stuff, last night, Jeremy and I attempted to uh, travel through the astral plane. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have done that before, but it's a lot of fun. I really just want to go to sleep. <laughs> but uh, we were uh, we were camping out at mom and dad's, getting ready for the show, and um, last night, last night, camping out, not like we literally just, we crashed in a tent. mom and dad's last night, yeah. just because we were researching late and it's close by. Plus, she made delicious meatloaf. That was good. Uh, anyways, end of the night, I was like, you know what? We we haven't listened to any binaural beats yet. Uh, we might touch on OBEs tomorrow. Jeremy, you haven't had an out of body experience yet. Let's try to get you out into that astral plane and explore the universe. Johnny, you haven't had one, right? Or have you? Mm -mm. So me, mom, dad, and Uncle John have. So it's just a matter of time until you guys find yourselves out there in the Akashic Records browsing. I don't remember mom having one. Yeah, she went to visit Uncle John. She flew to London. Whee! That's That's not an out-of-body experience. Mm. Yeah. It's more like remote viewing. I mean, this is pretty, I mean, the splitting hairs at that point, though. I mean, yeah. astral travel, remote view, out-of-body. kind of out a of big body. difference. What's the difference? Well, one, your soul is leaving, actually leaving well, your body. She said she was flying. Yeah, but... It wasn't just viewing. She felt she was yeah, there. Yeah, but you could remote view like that. You actually travel. So like, what's the difference? I don't know. Yeah. Let's just keep going. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, no, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I mean, I think the confusion sometimes is that near-death experience, obviously out of body, but you don't have to have a near-death experience to, to have right, an out-of-body right. experience. Anyway, so by normal beats. So we were doing this last night. We were using Robert Monroe's method of... Uh, guided meditation towards astral travel. Mm -hmm. And I have got fr freaked out a couple times. I almost left twice. I felt, or at least I felt the sensation I felt before that vibration. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to tell the story again. I feel like I've told it a bunch of times on the show, but um, listen to some older episodes, you'll probably come across it. Um, but that sense of vibration. And what I, I love about Robert Monroe, and he's kind of spearheaded this entire area of research. For out-of-body experiences? Yeah. I love how it, he started. And he seems so genuine when he talks about this. And it reminds me of my situation where they're not trying to. I think it's become sort of fashionable now. People want to experience this. They want to be astronauts in the astral plane. Astronauts, maybe? Yeah. But I think the majority of people that have out-of-body experiences, it's not something that they tried to do. It just happened. And I want to play a quick clip from Robert Monroe to set this up. It's like a minute long. So this is when he was asked... Why he got into this in the first place. And I, I love this response. It's fascinating. Want to do this type of research? Well, I had to face that question all the way back in, uh, would you believe it, back in 1958 and 59, which is a long ways back. I needed, desperately need to learn how to control it because I would suddenly move out of my body when I'm, any time I would lie down. And that became very embarrassing and very frightening. Every time I would lie down. I remember this story. And I had to learn how to control it. Conventional science had no answer whatsoever for that. My close friends, psychologists and psychiatrists didn't have the answer either. So we set up an R&D program in my company trying to find out answers for this. And uh, one of the things that happened, it took, for example, a full year of validation and documentation of where I went and what I did and what I perceived in order for me to recognize that it was nothing more than an hallucination. So it's not that easy to transfer it from what might be a dream or a, a, an hallucination into a reality. It just takes that left brain of ours. It takes sometimes a great deal of evidence to convince it. So to me, it's just, it's such a crazy idea. It almost reminds me of like the beginning of a Marvel movie or something where like there's a guy who's, he's in the area of sound. That's how he started to think of like, how can I investigate this through sound research? But he said every time he would lay down, he would just leave his body. He couldn't control it. He said it was embarrassing, terrifying and embarrassing. So it was really out of desperation that he started going down this Why was avenue. It embarrassing? Um, did he lay down in public a lot? <sighs> that's a good question. Well, he did take naps. Um, <laughs> public? But I would imagine like, you know, you can't wake up 
Maybe at the doctor's yeah, office. I'm you sure were, there's situations that would be hard. You're in a plane. Maybe embarrassing because he, well, he, he couldn't every, explain it. He couldn't every, tell people. Yeah, about it. and he said every time he laid down. So like at a friend's house. Uh, yeah, maybe he was on the couch, or something, leaning back watching. But TV. I thought in this it sounded like he said it wasn't until you know hours and hours of study about my experiences and w- working with these people in my company, and the team analyzing it, that we didn't find out it was nothing more than a hallucination. Yeah, because he said he was having these experiences where he was leaving his body, and since he'd never heard anyone say that it was possible to leave your body, he assumed he was hallucinating. He thought he was going in. Cr- I, okay, I thought it sounded like they proved it was hallucination. No, no, no he no, said no. it takes a long, long time to prove to your left part of your brain that it's not oh, a hallucination. Yeah. Okay, well that's cooler than Especially, what I thought I heard. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't mean much, would it? Yeah. Especially back then when this was not a topic of conversation, and you know this was right around the time like he starts doing this re- research. We did that um, near death experience episode where uh, what is this? name. His name escapes right now. Basically the father of near-death experience research, Raymond Moody. Oh, that's Remember? right. So he started his research shortly after this guy started his research. So this all sort of started to come to head almost like it was meant to at the same time. So one guy's having these crazy experiences without a body experiences. No one knows what that is. No one talks about this. He had a close friend who was a psychiatrist. He had no idea. So they started this research together. It wasn't until like 10 years later that uh, Moody started announcing his research with life after death, near-death experience. Oh, interesting. So they sort of coalesced at the same time, almost as if there was this, I'm going to get really out there. kind of collective unconscious. Right. This sort of universal movement towards human truth. Human truth. You said Um, that creepily. I know. Sorry, I had a lot of monster today. So interesting stuff. Do you guys want to hear binaural beat? Let's. I think we should play one from Sound Iron has a library, don't they? Or Mike has some, at least. He sent he us made. some to, to check out. Let's do it. You guys out there want to hear a binaural beat? Make sure you're buckled into we your will, couch. Uh, they do have some pr- kind of interesting effects for sure. Absolutely. Like they definitely can, you know, you you need to, if you're going to listen to them, you, you want to be in a in Put a those space. headphones on. You don't want to be doing anything else. Don't be mm-hmm. driving. Lay down. I mean, you're going to be okay if you're not wearing headphones. If you're not wearing headphones, yeah. But if you're wearing headphones and driving, which I had to do recently because my speaker stopped working. I mean, it's not going to like knock you out it unconscious, just, it's, but it can it knock you out like of a, your... There's like a pull that happens. Yeah, it definitely shifts you. I, I felt shifted. Just and that's to, what's funny. And that's why I think it definitely makes sense that uh, Robert Monroe recommends binaural beats for attempting out-of-body experiences is because listening to that... It has that effect, that pull you're talking about. Mm-hmm. If you've ever had an out-of-body experience or gotten close to one, you know that sensation. Right. That sort of vibrating and that sort of pull out of you. Mm-hmm. I always say, when I try to explain it to people, it's like when you're looking at a magic eye poster where you're crossing your eyes really hard mm-hmm. and you get that sensation of movement and you're letting it sort of yeah, come, that's a good, come good into analogy. fruition. That's exactly oh. what it feels like when you have an out-of-body experience. And you start to feel that pull and I think... And then it happens. And then, then you're just... You're out of it. Chris, you always ask me about how I can do the eye twitching thing. Mm-hmm. You know the... Yeah. I don't know if you can see it from there, John. I can make my eyes vibrate really fast. It's the same feeling. Cross your eyes, yeah. Now, if you make your eyes... that eye, feeling? Whoa, that's a weird feeling. You can make your eyes shudder like that. That's yeah. How, you know, it's like intense focus. That's the sensation, that solar, solar plexusness. We probably... Well, we probably should just let people listen to it for a second. Yeah, I was going to say our friend from Sound Iron, Mike, who sent these over, we were listening to it right before it, that that's exactly what started to happen to me. And, and he, he's like, yeah, we're not claiming these are going to you know, right, make you right. go out of body or anything, yeah, but yeah. they can have an effect to shift your... They're more for meditation, conception states. a little bit, yeah. but it, that's what it was doing when we put it on a minute ago. I forget which one it was, but... God helmet I was, too. I was physically feeling, like instantly my eyes started feeling pressure and I felt like uh, this kind of vibration in my uh, solar plexus. No, maybe so you're just weird. Maybe you're more susceptible. I felt very, almost uneasy. It was very effective in a weird way. All right, let's play it. Also, this is going to work best with headphones. And if you don't have larger speakers, like if you're listening on a phone, it's probably going to be really hard to hear these lower frequencies. So get in front of some big speakers or put some headphones on. Is there something in the background of that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sounds like a distant wolf. It's like a creature. Okay, so we're just going to give you a sample. We're going to leave these in a link so you can actually yeah. play with them more. That one was God Helmet too, right? Are we let, We can give access to our listeners to these? Yeah, he said we could link. Oh, that's cool. Lucky ducks out there. No, God Helmet, that's interesting. Because a God Helmet was an invention that was created, and the effect of it is basically the feeling. It's supposed to simulate a near-death experience. Oh, it, really? It gives you the sensation that there was a, a omnipotent presence in the room, or another presence that's not there. Well, that is a good name for it. Yeah. yeah. Let's try another one. Oh, wow. Some 
something like weird. Oh yeah, it's like when a phase. You talk, it's like a weird. F- or, unless we're shifting. Come on, that's weird. Come on, come on. <laughs> Whoa, that was weird. Yeah. I honestly felt like my fingers. This sounds so Feels weird and silly, but like I felt like as soon as that started playing, my fingers contracted. <laughs> Is that weird? Like that, you know, like like my sure, hands clenched a little over. bit. I don't know why. I've been like really affected by these. Like in a physical way, I have a response to them. It's weird. Oh god, wait, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> there he goes, ladies and gentlemen. This is the one earlier that made my eyes feel thick. It feels good. It's like an internal massage. That's awesome. It sounds like the score from Mandy. Oh, woo. Dizzy from it. I like that. I, that one. I, do you feel like an, yeah. an upward Where movement? Where we go? My, I, so quiet. That's pretty great. Yeah. That that one. Which one was that, John? Uh, Sack. All right, guys. Check out Sack. <laughs> That's such a great descriptive name for it. Sac. Check out Sack and uh, God Helmet too. Those are my favorite. I think anyway. Those are supposed to be temporary names. I don't think they mean too okay. much. Okay. God Helmet probably does. Yeah. God Helmet. Well, one. That Sack. I gotta say, for for such a little name, it was a big effect. That was the one that before the show. Want to try one like, more? Yeah. Let's do one more. Very intense. Two Space Odyssey. It does remind me of Hal a little bit. Yeah, Hal from Two Thousand One Space Odyssey. The ambiance of the Two Thousand One Space Odyssey. Like yeah, definitely. He, that's the scene where Dave's going to turn off the computer. Hal mm-hmm. and uh, oh. Dave, he's like, Dave, <laughs> what are you doing, Dave? <laughs> it's <laughs> it's so kind good. of like background. Yeah. Yeah. That was great, man. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really Something about this. I'm really. Uh, I, I didn't expect that much of a sensation, honestly. Can you imagine you now just being in a dark room by yourself? No, or being in a flotation be tank. In flotation yeah, tank. or sauna. Rad. I want to do that. Thank you, Mike. Those are cool. Yeah, guys, check those out. Um, yeah, I'll, pretty I'll be checking awesome. those out. Let us know if anyone experiences anything crazy. Yeah, yeah, probably not from that, but if you check these out, we'll have links in our show notes. No, not from this, but if you try them later. Yeah, they're, they're mostly recommended. You got to do them for a while, I think, before, you know, you really yeah. potentially could break out of your body or whatever. I th- yeah, I think these are, these are, <laughs> yeah. Mike said that they're for like guided meditation, not really for out-of-body experiences, right, right, but right. you never know. Some people I might was be ready prone. to rip, I, man. Yeah, honestly, I think that those the second have potential one, I, to do other things than just meditation. Yeah, I don't think Mike knows what he's got there. What if it's a trick? He's got a rocket ship. <laughs> what if it's a trick? Jeremy's feeling his fingers move because Mike is getting inside Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> Stay out, Mike. <laughs> I don't want it. No, it was really cool, man. Yeah, I really, great. really liked it. <laughs> it's like psychic rape. Cool. Uh, should we take another break? Yeah, let's take a quick break, and we'll be back after these short pauses that will be turning into a longer session of pauses. <laughs> with music inside of them. All right, bye. back in off rails welcome now welcome back to our show thanks for sticking around ding ding yeah guys thanks for coming back um if you want to get more in touch with your binaural beat self we'll have links for that in the show notes we just kind of briefly touched on that this time around now i want to get into a quick little tale of ancient sound technology Ooh, I'm oh, excited about this. This will lead us into the expansion, mm-hmm. Con- conceptually. Yeah, what's going on in the expansion, Jerry? So the expansion, a- I'm going to be getting into, like I mentioned earlier in this episode, uh, some evidence for ancient sound sonic technology, things such as sonic drilling. For instance, uh, we find a lot of uh, inexplicable boreholes 
Uh, per- Ooh, perfectly inex- inexplicable hewn. boreholes. Yes, I know we've come across them all the time. You probably are out walking around. You might have seen some inexplicable boreholes as you <laughs> wander the ancient ruins of your homeland. I feel like someone who doesn't like our show is now going to use that as a criticism of Bleef Hole. It's a borehole. Why? Because look at John. He looks very bored. Oh, a borehole. Yeah, get it? The Bleef Hole is just one big borehole. <laughs> wow, you're making it a borehole right this moment. Anyways, yeah, so the idea that there are these inexplicable explanations for a lot of uh, ancient constructions, crafting of statues and like uh, very hard things like igneous rock, like granite, diorite, things like this, that with the tools that they supposedly had at the time, doesn't really make sense. And I'm going to break that down. Why? And also... Is that a pun? Sorry. (laughs) Break down that and an alternative theory for how this could have been done using tools at the time with this kind of sonic technology that is hinted at in the hieroglyphics themselves, specifically in ancient Egypt. So we're going to get into that kind of stuff. That's a tuning fork, laser beams, right? Also, apparently... Cancer can potentially be cured with sonic technology. I don't We're think also you're allowed get, to say that. Though. I know. Well, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> Ask your physician first. Just call it call it canker. <laughs> uh, but there, you know, there's evidence to show that there are these alternative healing methods uh, using sonic technology. Yeah, We're going to get into that. That's been proven throughout history, or proven if you want to believe that. We're going to show the evidence for it. It's going to be interesting. Alleged throughout history, and we're having groundbreaking research done all the time. Right. Anyway, that'll be coming up in the expansion episode. We'll also talk about some modern. Uh, crazy sound technology that's being developed right oh, now. I forgot about that. I know, we're not going to have time for the main episode, but Shucks it is buckets. very fascinating. So uh, definitely check out the expansion. But for now, let's give a little taste by telling a very under-the-radar story about anti-gravity and the world grid. So this I call Tibetan stone hurdling. Have you guys heard of this? Hurling. Rather. Yeah, I was talking about that uh, yesterday with Dad. <laughs> oh, yeah? Tibetan stone hurling. He's a big fan. So Tibetan stone hurling. So this is this story comes from. This is a story thrice removed. It seems like. So I pulled this directly from David Hatch Childress's book. Remember him? Oh yeah, the big balls guy. Big balls. Giant balls. Stone balls of the gods. Who made these balls? Really large stone balls. So this comes from his book. A New Zealand scientist recently gave me an intriguing extract from an article published in a German magazine relating to a demonstration of levitation in Tibet. After obtaining a translation by a German journalist in English, I was amazed at the information contained in the story and was surprised that the article had slipped through the suppression net, which tends to keep such knowledge from leaking out to the public. All the similar types of stories that I had read up until now were generally devoid of specific information necessary to prove the veracity of the account. In this case, a full set of geometric measurements were taken, and I discovered to my great delight that when they were converted into their equivalent geodetic measures relating to grid harmonics, the values gave a direct association with those in the unified harmonic equations published in my earlier works. The following extracts are trans translations from the German article. The following report is based on observations which were made only 20 years ago in Tibet. I have this report from civil engineer and flight manager Henry Kelsen, a friend of mine. He later on included this report in his book, The Lost Techniques, 1952. Or it might be The Lost Technologies. This is a bit of a translation. Okay. This is his report. A Swedish doctor, Dr. Jarl, a friend of Kelsen's, studied at Oxford. During those times, he became friends with a young Tibetan student. A couple years later, it was 1939, Dr. Jarl made a journey to Egypt for the English Scientific Society. There he was seen by a messenger of his Tibetan friend and urgently requested to come to Tibet to treat a high lama. After Dr. Jarl got the leave, he followed the messenger and arrived after a long journey by plane and yak caravans. Oh, way to travel at the monastery where the old lama and his friend, who was now holding a high position, were now living. Dr. Jarl stayed there for some time, and because of his friendship with the Tibetans, he learned a lot of things that other foreigners had no chance to hear about or observe. One day his friend took him to a place in the neighborhood of the monastery and showed him a sloping meadow, which was surrounded in the northwest by high cliffs. In one of the rock walls, at a height of about 250 meters, was a big hole, which looked like the entrance to a cave. In front of this hole, there was a platform on which the monks were building a rock wall. The only access to this platform was from the top of the cliff, and the monks lowered themselves down with the help of ropes. In the middle of the meadow, about 250 meters from the cliff, was a polished slab of rock with a bowl-like cavity in the center. The bowl had a diameter of one meter and a depth of 15 centimeters. 
a block of stone was maneuvered into this cavity by yak oxen. The block was one meter wide and one and a half meters long. Then, 19 musical instruments were set in an arc of 90 degrees at a distance of 63 meters from the stone slab. The musical instruments consisted of 13 drums and six trumpets, or ragdons. Um, so I'll, we'll, we'll have more details in the drums. You guys check this out. If you want to know the dimensions, if you want to try to replicate the actual throwing of boulders with sound technology. Well, that's yeah, <laughs> weird. Uh, the big drums and all the trumpets were fixed on mounts, which could be adjusted with staffs in the direction of the slab of stone. The big drums were made of three millimeter thick sheet iron and were built in five sections. All of the drums were open at one end, while the other end had a bottom of metal on which the monks beat with big leather clubs. Behind each instrument was a row of monks. The situation is demonstrated in the diagram that will be in our show notes. So if you guys check out this image in the show notes, it's basically you have this sort of half circle of monks and trumpets and drums that are all pointing their voices and instrument blasts at this how would you say that, John? Parabola? That sort of like parabola. parabola-shaped dish. And in that dish is the stone that they want to launch into the sky at this cave hole. <laughs> That's well, basically are, what's going why on. Why are they doing that? Uh, I don't know. Oh, interesting. We'll keep, maybe we'll find out if we keep okay. reading. Okay. When the stone was in position, the monk behind the small drum gave a signal to start the concert. The small drum had a very sharp sound and could be heard even with the other instruments making a terrible din. All the monks were singing and chanting a prayer, slowly increasing the tempo of this unbelievable noise. During the first four minutes, nothing happened. Then, as the speed of the drumming and the noise increased, the big stone block started to rock and sway, and suddenly it took off into the air. With an increasing speed in the direction of the platform, in front of the cave hole 250 meters high, after three minutes of ascent, it landed on the platform. Continuously, they brought new blocks to the meadow, and the monks, using this method, transported five to six blocks per hour on a parabolic flight track approximately 500 meters long and 250 meters high. That's crazy. That's... From time to time, a stone split, and the monks moved the split stones away. Quite an unbelievable task. Dr. Jarl knew about the hurling of the stones. Tibetan experts like Spalding and Hugh had spoken about it, but they had never seen it. So Dr. Jarl was the first foreigner who had the opportunity to see this remarkable spectacle. Because he had the opinion in the beginning that he was the victim of mass psychosis, he made two films of the incident. The films showed exactly the same things that he had witnessed. Really? Well, and then they were allegedly confiscated by the organization that sent them there. Yeah. That's the conspiracy theory. Every time. Yeah. But I mean, crazy, if it's true. I mean, fascinating stuff. It's, this is kind of hard to find the story because it was tucked away. The guy who wrote the original account was a Swedish guy, and this guy seems super legit. Henry Kelsen. Henry Kelsen, yes. Henry Kelsen, he was a well-known, respected flight director with a master's in science, graduating from the KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Oh, in Stockholm. But he was the leading flight engineer for the Swedish Air Force. And later mm. during his career, it became the director. After he was done with that, then he started writing these books because he was always fascinated with this idea that he'd come to believe was a certain truth. Right. Was that there was an, at least one ancient, way advanced civilization that at some point we had forgotten about. And that sounds familiar, doesn't it, with all the yeah. stuff we've covered in the past? So he toured the world trying to find evidence of this. And this is one of these situations where he had the story where allegedly had this good friend who had witnessed this firsthand. Talk to Jarl. So you don't want, yeah, your head flight director believing in flying stones from chanting monks. He's a kook. Well, he was retired by the time he wrote the book. Okay, so the story included. Okay, so he was retired. But obviously this guy, <laughs> I mean, yeah, like you say, he was an educated guy, well-respected in right. his field was involved and directed some very important things as far as keeping people from falling out of the sky. Yeah, fun and fact. And he believes that rocks can be floated by monks. He also he also engineered the first uh, plane for the Swedish Air Force called the, like Olivia for short or something. But uh, I, I thought this was cool. In 1934, he won the Olympics for archery. archery. Ooh, nice. Yeah. I guess he got involved in archery in 1931 and then he realized he could improve the bow and did some sort of tinkering with the engineering of the bow and used some sort of metal bow. And uh, the next year won the Olympics. So that's <laughs> cool. So this guy, he was a smart cookie. It'd be sweet to get involved in a sport and be like, you know what, I'm going to make my 
uh, shin guards better. And anyone that kicks me is going to break their legs. And I, then they wins the soccer. She has how it would work, <laughs> right? right? Again, cup. again, this account that he's describing here was one that his friend told him he saw firsthand. Sure, it could oh, be. Really, it could be a case of like Molder syndrome. Maybe he just he wants to believe he believes his friend. But I thought it was pretty fascinating that he had such a extensive background yeah. in engineering and believed his friend who was also a doctor. Yeah, a one degree away from that experience. Right. That's, anyway, that is pretty fascinating, Chris. Yeah. If you guys are interested in hearing more stories of and more evidence, uh, probably maybe more. Um, uh, dis- discernible evidence of advanced sound technology in our ancient history, definitely check out the expansion episode. But thank you everyone for being here. Uh, we have some quick names to uh, read off, new patrons that have joined us, uh, eight deeper in the hole. And if you guys are interested in becoming a patron uh, or a member uh, and getting expansion episodes every time we release a regular episode, you can go to our website, beliefful.com and click on the Patreon button. All right, so patrons to thank. Yes. Thank you, new patrons, including Melissa Kramer. Zing. Jody Wentz. Uh-huh. Yeah. Riley Ray. Jackson Rush. Jackson. London Keplinger. Awesome. London. David Meyer. David Meyer. Jessica Graham. Yes. Zing. TJ Snyder. Snides. <laughs> Snide Dog. Snide Dog. Nate. Nate, what do we Oscar Romo. Oscar Romo. Oscar Romo. Oh. Oscar. <laughs> I said, I said it. Oscar, Oscar Romo. <laughs> Lindsay Crocker. Lindsay. Crocker. Good night. Cat Paris. Another cat. Cats love the show. And dogs too. What are you doing? Wow. Sorry. Ghost? <laughs> <laughs> and dogs too. Do the monster man. <laughs> That's what that is. Sorry. I don't know why I did that. Uh, Jacob Sindel. Hi, Jacob. Thanks for joining. Sound Iron Sampling. And that's Mike from Sound Iron. Right. Yeah, appreciate it, Mike. Yeah. And that's it, everybody. That's All our right, new guys. additions to the uh, belie- the deeper hole of Belief Hole. Yay. So if you guys are interested, go to Beliefful.com, click on the Patreon button, and uh, join us. Support the show, guys, yeah. if you like it. Get it while it's hot. And thank you for everyone that left reviews and uh, shared it with your friends, whatever you've been able to yeah, do. That that's been awesome. Yeah, does help so much. Keep doing it. Keep spreading that word. Spread the whole, guys. The shows are definitely as fun, if not more fun. On the expansion? The, on the expansion. So. Yeah, it's just, it just feels a little, yeah. It's like said still, that before, it's still but good it's, research, but we're kind of warmed up from the first day of recording. So if you if you want more of the whole, it's a good way to like expand on it. If you it. like your whole a little deeper, a little warmer, a little okay. warmer. slide in there Alrighty. get a little more information. Here we go. Come on over. All right, guys. Thank you for checking out today's episode and we will see you soon. Yes. Have a good evening or day or morning. Until next time on The Belief Hole. No. Then I just like to do it. Goodbye. Goodbye.